You should always be saying yes, you know, always <laughs> don't put stuff down. You should always uh, be open to new ideas and new relationships. Hey guys, uh, we have none other than Guy Kawasaki on the show. So Guy Kawasaki is famous for being the chief evangelist of Apple and um, he has impacted us in so many ways. Uh, he's currently the chief evangelist of Canva, which we extensively use. Um, he also is the brand ambassador of Mercedes-Benz. And more importantly, he's the writer of 50 books. Uh, recently finished the book, Wise Guy, Lessons from a uh, Life. So I really love the book. Uh, Guy, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to reach your, uh, your listeners and viewers. Yeah, guys, so just to give you a context so we can give a better uh, audi uh, value to our audience. So I am um, the head of Growth Next Academy. So we are the uh, leading coding and digital marketing school here in Southeast Asia. I'm currently here in Malaysia. I think you've been to parts of the world here. Um, so a lot of people go through our academy and become tech founders or become coders or become digital marketers or marketers like yourself. So it's great having you on the show. <laughs> and um, I cannot believe I'm speaking to you because uh, <laughs> I've been following you for, I think, at least more than 10 years. And about 10 years ago, uh, it was the time when you were promoting the art of the start. Uh -huh. And I was in college at that time, and I could not afford the book, The Art of the Start. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I went and downloaded, I think you had a slide share of The Art of the Start, and uh, I printed it out. And um, I, at that time in college, I really loved reading all your material and your books that I think I wrote most of my papers on Guy Kawaki. Kawasaki said this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you do, you know, being the evangelist of of Apple. So thanks so much for all the content and all you do. Um, you even impacted people right across the earth. Uh, cool. Yeah, so I love your book as well. So can you briefly tell us why, why do you call it a wise guy? Um, lessons from a life like what is a wise guy? Well, the wise guy is I, I'm trying to in the United States wise guy has several connotations. One is that you're a kind of smart aleck. Another is that you're a mafia guy. And uh, I, I wanted to just play on those definitions and really provide wisdom, um, yeah. which is not related to either of those definitions. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, I think the most used word in your book is not wise guy, but you called yourself multiple times a lucky guy in the book. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. think it's true, with, too. Yeah. With most, most things, I think you, you have the talent and you had the opportunity. So luck definitely played a lot, a big role in your journey and really love yeah. the book to see your journey. And um, one of the things I really love about your book is you talk about the other book that most impacted your life in the beginning of the book that made you write so many books. So can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I talk about the books that impacted my life just as I hope that my book impacts people's lives. So the books that impacted my life, well, the, the, the major one, there's two really. So one is called If You Want to Write by Brenda Euland. And uh, it's for writers, but it can apply to anybody who's in a creative kind of function, entrepreneur, programmer, artist, whatever it is. So that's one. And the second one is Influenced by Bob Cialdini. And that's a book about social psychology. So those books uh, were very formative for me. Yeah. And um, since reading that, that book, you have written so many books. So how has writing books, you know, helped you in, in your career or in your business? Well, I'm, you know, I never really wrote books to, quote, help my career. Uh, in fact, I, when people tell me that you know, they want to write a book because it's going to help them get speeches or it's going to help them get consulting or position themselves as a thought leader, uh, I tell them not to write the book because, you know, you, you, you're supposed to write a book because you have something to say, not because you want to use it as a marketing device. And, yeah, most books don't work as a marketing device because people see through your motivation. 
So I didn't write this book to position me or, you know, do anything like that. Um, I wrote it because, well, two reasons, royalty and um, I, wanted, I wanted to pass on his wisdom. Yeah, that's, that's great. And uh, great learnings from your, your book as well and from your many other books. Um, and uh, I, I cannot leave this interview uh, without asking you uh, about for a uh, Steve Jobs story, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's what you were saying every keynote. Um, yeah, sure. but, but I, I love the part on, of your book of the gospel of Steve Jobs. So, um, I, what I want to ask you, is there any story that you haven't told many people in, uh, in regards to Steve Jobs? Well, I, you know, I usually tell one particular story. So, uh, I, I, that's the story I love to tell. Okay. Yeah. So, the story is that I'm working in my cubicle. He shows up with somebody I've never met, and he asks me about a company. And I tell him that the company is mediocre, the software is mediocre, it's not important for Apple. And then he says to me, I want you to meet the CEO of the company. You know, totally bushwhacking me. And that's just a great insight into how Steve Jobs operated. You know, you, you were always being tested. Yeah. And um, I love how you said in the book, or you said many times, that tough bosses and tough teachers are the greatest teachers of life. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I had a really hard English teacher in high school, and of course I had a really hard boss, Steve Jobs. And as I look back, I think that the teachers who were the toughest and the bosses that were the toughest are the ones that you learn the most from. Uh, many people try to find the easiest teacher and the easiest professor and the easiest boss and I think that's a mistake. You don't learn the most from them. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how, how Steve Jobs was tough? I think you said it in other places, but how was exactly he tough? Well, he was tough in that he was very demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And he knew what he wanted. And, you know, sometimes you work for a boss and you know you know more than them, right? So... If anything, you may have to dumb it down for them, but you can definitely uh, outsmart your boss. I, there are very few people who could outsmart Steve Jobs, if any. <laughs> and so I think that was the key, that you know, he, he truly was a visionary and uh, high IQ, high intelligence. Now, you know, a lot of people like to claim that they're a visionary, and, and I would say that they're flattering themselves. They, you know, they have no clue. Um, in American business, there's been Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, you know, Thomas Edison, and Elon Musk. There have been four or five ever. So I think that's the key. That you know, he truly was a visionary. Yeah, and and I I myself have worked with a lot of tough bosses, and some of them are really brilliant, and they are tough because they they are really that good, and they expect that from everyone. And in your experience, who, who are the people that worked best with a person like Steve Jobs? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's someone who's tough and smart. If you're just tough but not smart, you're going to get smart. And if you're smart but not tough, you're, gonna, you're just going to collapse. You have to be both. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's great. That's great insight. Yeah, you have to be both. And you need to manage people as well. <laughs> actually, actually, among among your resume, uh, guy, I'm I'm more I'm I'm the most impressed. You you have done so many things, but I, I'm the most impressed that you are the brand ambassador of Mercedes Benz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not not many business people are brand ambassadors, right? Like most true. brand ambassadors, uh, celebrities, athletes. So so I really would love. Uh, to hear the story and for you to tell my audience the story of how you became the brand ambassador of Mercedes. Well, I became the brand ambassador of Mercedes because I ran into some of the marketing people from Mercedes at South by Southwest. And I told them that I was coming to Germany about a month later and I would love to visit a factory. So they set me up to visit the factory of AMG where AMG was making the GT, their sports car. And it was, I was the first person allowed in the factory from the public. And so we just got to be friends. And I said, you know, we should do more stuff. And I work with a lot of car companies, but, you know, I, I just go exclusive with you guys. And, you know, one thing led to another. 
I've been brand ambassador for about three and a half years now with Mercedes. Yeah, I think uh, great, great marketers are generally great networkers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of the stories that you tell in your book, it's, it's the opportunity and also building that deep relationship with everyone that you know, that you get, you know, um, get the opportunities that you have. So yeah. th there's a great lesson there in, you know, building great relationships and seizing the opportunity, that, that opportunity. Yeah. So, um, and, and you are also the evangelist for Canva and I really love using uh, Canva. In fact, That's in our right. academy, uh, we know that, that content is the foundation for marketing, you know, mm -hmm. if social media and digital Without content, you can't really stand out. So we teach our students to use Canva Great. as part of our course. And in fact, a lot of our marketing material, um, we use Canva to create our, you know, our images. And even our designers who are very great at Photoshop, they use Canva as well because that's where you create, efficiently <laughs> create the best designs. Um, can you also tell the story since we talked about opportunity, how you also became the evangelist of Canva? Yeah, so uh, I have a, a person who helps me with my social media. Her name is Peg Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, five years ago or so, uh, I was already active on Twitter, and my theory on Twitter is every tweet has to have a graphic. And she was using Canva to make my graphics. And Canva noticed that I was using Canva, so they tweeted me. I happened to see that tweet and responded. Then I asked Peggy, you know, is this the company you use? Do you like them? Should I help them? And she said, you know, yes to all of the questions. So I met with them and one thing just led to another. Yeah. And um, it's, it's almost the same as the Mercedes story that, you know, yeah. you, 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 it's, it's a connection formed across the world and a, a partnership formed because you, both of you took the opportunity and both of you built that real connection. Yeah. And, you know, I think a very important thing, you know, some wisdom from this is um, you should always be saying yes, you know, always <laughs> don't put stuff down. You should always uh, be open to new ideas and new relationships. And uh, you should maybe not plan as much because none of this was planned. <laughs> so when I plan stuff, it never happens. It's when I don't plan that it happens. <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, a lot of times you are an evangelist, you know, even back in your Apple days. So, mm -hmm. um, what what exactly is an evangelist? Um, evangelism comes from a Greek word meaning bringing the good news. Mm -hmm. So, what an evangelist does is bring the good news. I brought the good news of Macintosh. I am bringing the good news of Canva. Mm -hmm. So, Macintosh democratized computing. Canva has democratized graphics. So that's what we do. We, de we democratize design. We made it so that anybody, even you, could make great designs. Anyone can make a great book cover to yeah. you know, great social media graphics. and. Internet. I don't know if you know this, but you know, we have a 16 by 9 template for making presentations. And now with Canva, you can save to the native PowerPoint format. So you design it in Canva, you save or export to PowerPoint, and then you can run it with PowerPoint. You can also run it with Canva, but sometimes, like I speak a lot, and I have to give my presentation in PowerPoint to somebody because they're going to insert my slides into the master slides. And so I can't be using a separate app. They have to put my slides into a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, now you can go from Canva to PowerPoint. Wow, that's great, great learnings. I've never used Canva for presentations before. Maybe from some ima images, but not really no. presentations. Well, now you can have beautiful presentations. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I used to use Canva to create GIFs for videos. Yeah. So yeah. you could actually save it as a video, and that's yeah. how I created a lot of ads. I used to create a lot of ads with Canva as well. It's a great tool. Oh, wow. and you created a lot of what with it? Ads, uh, Facebook oh, ads, yeah. cool, cool. very yeah. cool. So if if you cannot find a way to make video, so you can yeah. use Canva, and the paid version has the 
GIF video version, and you can make your graphics move, and that becomes an ad. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's that's great. And and you talked about you know giving presentations. Um, so can you give us some wisdom, and you know you give your keynotes? Yeah. So um, first of all, regarding slides, I think you should have only about ten slides, mm -hmm. and I think the background should be black. I think the font should be a minimum of 30 points and white. <laughs> and I recommend that, you know, your mindset when you're giving a speech is that you have to entertain people. And if you entertain them, you will probably also inform them. But if you only think you have to inform them, then you're going to put up too many slides, too much information, you know, too many graphs, too many everything. So speaking is about entertainment, not information. <laughs> Um, if you entertain, you can probably inform, but if you inform, that doesn't mean you'll entertain and it doesn't mean that you will capture your audience. So always be thinking, how can I entertain them while providing information? And then I would say, you know, practice, uh, get to the venue early so that you're very comfortable. Try to meet people in the first few rows before you go on. So when you look out, you know, you see people who you've already met, you took pictures with, they like you, they're smiling, it builds your confidence. Uh, try to get a small room so the room feels packed. Uh, these are all little tips that can make you a better speaker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one more. Tell stories. Always tell stories. You know, stop using adjectives about patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting. Just tell a story of why you created your product, why you created your service how you came to do this. Um, stories are much better than adjectives. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I think I took your advice 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago, you already had this advice. And I'll tell you a true story what happened. I was in, 10 years ago, about, I was about 21. And I was giving my final, final year presentation of my yeah. research. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a research presentation in front of three professors. Yeah, um, I sort of gave the best presentation because I was a big fan of you and big fan of Steve Jobs at the time. And I had one words and very few like, images and telling stories. But the thing was, in front of an educational crowd, you need at least some data. <laughs> you need at least some pie charts or some data to be yeah. a bit more educational. That, that's my, my, my experience in that. But if you're giving a keynote or giving a speech yeah. at a conference, by, by all means, you can do, do that. So are you saying that you, you didn't get your degree or you didn't pass Oh, I got my degree. I got like best presentation. <laughs> but like um, I, I got a feeling that the professors, you know, like people in education didn't really uh, see anything like that or, or <laughs> couldn't really see the substance. They wanted to see like data, you know. There were some slides on data, but it was not too much data centric. I think if you're a doctor presenting at like a medical conference, perhaps you yeah. need like very data driven side and you need to be conveying more information. So that's, that's what I think yeah. about that anyway. Maybe in this circumstance, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, just, just a side note. Yeah. Um, and and um, a lot of our graduates, you know, um, take up, learn coding or learn digital marketing. Um, so at different points of your career, you, you were, sometimes you were part of a great company and sometimes you quit the great company to start your own thing, you know, start your own venture. So um, a lot of questions I, I get nowadays is, is it better to be an entrepreneur to start something or to work for a big company? Well, I, I don't think there's any right or wrong answers to that, everybody's different. Uh, yeah. People have different interests, different passions. They also have different circumstances. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you have four kids and, and, you know, you can't give the 60 or 70 hours a week and you need medical insurance, well, then you know, go work for a big company. Yeah, On the yeah. other hand, if you have zero kids and you, you know, you're living with your parents, then go for it. Um, yeah. And some people like risk and some people don't, but you have to like risk to be an entrepreneur. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of variables. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the sort of in this, in 2019, it's 
an easier part to start. Distribution is cheap, marketing is much cheaper, so a lot of people are starting companies. It's easier to start your own thing nowadays, so a lot of people are agree. Right. It's much easier to start, and uh, yeah, basically everything you need, like marketing is social media, which is free, and the tools are open source, and you, you, know, you have virtual teams using um, high-speed internet, and you can you can crowdsource uh, ideas. You can crowd fund mm. instead of raising venture capital. Um, well, so basically, everything you want is either cheap or free. So <laughs> I, I think it's a lot easier to start a company today. Now, this is good news and bad news. Well, it's if it's a lot easier to to start a company, it's also a lot easier for everybody else to start a company. And therein lies the, the rub that, you know, now you're competing with so many more people. Yeah, that's the, the, the entry, entry point is much lower. So anyone can start anything with any idea. It all depends on, on the execution. Yep. Um, so being from uh, an academy, um, you, you stress the importance of education and learning and uh, Nowadays, a lot of people say, don't go to college, learn a skill. And, and at your age, I think you are still learning. So what are, you know, what are your wisdom when it comes to learning or education? Well, just to understand that yeah. learning is not an event. And, yeah. you know, it's not an event that ends when you graduate college or high school. Learning is a process, and that should continue for your whole life. I could almost make the argument that learning truly begins when you graduate, not when you uh, you know, enter school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and continuously learn. You know, as as you grow, and yeah. even when you are starting your own company or um, working for someone. Well, especially when you're <laughs> starting your company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what what I love about your book is you also talk about. Um, I think in your in most of your speeches you said about. Um, creating meaning, uh, making a dent in the universe, you know, instead of focusing on making money. And a lot of our graduates are coders and tech people. So, you know, what is your advice to someone who is starting out now? Should they focus, how can they focus on making, me, uh, making meaning? Well, the, the key here is that if the sole motivation for starting something is to make money, uh, I think that's a shallow goal. Mm -hmm. And my observation is that if you make people's lives better, democratizing computing, democratizing design, entertaining them, informing them, anything like that, then if you do that successfully, probably you'll also make money. Whereas if you just want to make money, literally, that's all you want to do is make money, go be an investment banker. Uh, don't be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you were part of Apple, did you have that sense of, you know, you are making a big difference in the world? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Steve Jobs you know, convinced us that if Macintosh was not successful, it would be the end of the earth. I mean, <laughs> it, it would be totalitarianism. It would be, you know, just like George Orwell, 1984. Great, great, great stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of companies tend to uh, make, uh, you know, try to achieve meaning. But mm -hmm. as, as you said in your book, there are a lot of companies who um, are doing things that seem stupid. Yeah. Um, you said that you didn't join Yahoo because it seemed like a stupid idea at that time. Well, I mean... I don't know if I would say it was a stupid idea, but I didn't get it. I didn't, at the time, Yahoo was just a collection of Jerry and David's favorite websites. It was a directory, right? Yeah. And so I just didn't see the model. I didn't see, you know, why that mattered. And uh, it was too far to drive. I mean, there's a lot of stupid reasons on my part for not taking that interview. Yeah. And, and today, there might be a lot of, you know, uh, back to your example, you said YouTube was, exploding because people are creating videos of coke, uh, mentos in coke <laughs> so a, a stupid idea that you would think nowadays is things like musically and tiktok where people are just like 
lip syncing or creating small short videos yeah. but yeah. those things might be the you the next big thing yeah, you, you never, never know. know you never know and yeah that that's great like you know any any idea or anything that you think it's a bit silly might be the next big, next big thing oh. yeah, there are some stupid ideas that succeed but i'm not saying that every stupid idea succeeds <laughs> You know, don't wake up in the morning saying, I got to find a stupid idea. Uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. It's just that some stupid ideas turn out to be smart. But not every stupid idea turns out to be smart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to be smart about the stupid ideas. Yeah, yeah. and lucky. Yeah. And um, um, uh, I think uh, I've run through most of your book and most of the questions, but um, you, you are also advisor to a lot of tech startups. Um, and and what, what normally do you advise on when you are advisor? Uh, do you advise uh, usually, on marketing? Usually the marketing and product introduction mm -hmm. and how to use social media. Basically marketing uh, is my expertise. Yeah, yeah, being being such a legend in the marketing industry. <laughs> so okay, sorry, that's okay. So have I given you all you wanted? Yeah, yeah. Um, with, like you, you also have like a big following on social media. So on on Twitter, you have about one point five million followers, and like a, a, a lot, also a lot of followers on LinkedIn. And after this, I'm going to connect with you on LinkedIn. So hopefully, you accept my request. Um, <laughs> Maybe. So what, what, sorry? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what uh, wisdom do you have when it comes to social media? Well, the greatest wisdom I can pass for social media is mm -hmm. always try to provide value. Mm -hmm. Information, analysis, entertainment, whatever it is, but value. And if you provide value, then you earn the right to promote. So think of Wikipedia and NPR, you know, National Public Radio in the U.S., where Wikipedia and NPR provides great content, so they earn the right to ask for donations, and they are quite successful. Mm. So the key is to earn that right. Yeah, so it just provide value so you can earn uh, the right to have a large following. <laughs> yeah. So before I go, uh, I'm actually in the Far East in Malaysia. So any thoughts or any experiences you have with the Far East? Uh, only that it's so humid there. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the humidity is high and the food is good and the people are friendly. So What about the tech scene or the, the marketing scene? Anything you've seen? Honestly, I have not had that much contact with entrepreneurs there, so I don't know. I mean, yeah. my experience going around the world is that entrepreneurs are more or less the same all over the world. Yeah. And, you know, they're all, they view the world as half full, not half empty, and they're trying to dent the universe. Yeah. And they're even romantic. Entrepreneurs are the same all over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, uh, guys. Thank you. Sorry? Well, it's been a real pleasure. I, I suppose yeah. it's really early in the morning there, so thank yeah. you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for your time, uh, guys. All righty.